First, a question about perfectionism. Who, who is bothered from time to time with its, uh, ten their tendency towards uh, perfectionism? Raise your hands. To be a perfect employee or a perfect mother or father. Well, I, have, I am bothered with that uh, tendency. We live actually in a world ruled by perfectionism. And um, we want to have a perfect life, many of us. Look at all the apps that are available, self-help and self-improvement, and we want to try to, to measure everything with IQ tests, performance and productivity in indicators, curated uh, biographies, how many likes you have on social media, etc., etc. Everything is measurable, and with our mind, our reason, our knowledge, we can achieve success and prosperity. It's all about creating and taking opportunities um, and, um, for someone to succeed in life, to get the best education possible. And it's all about using our talents, our gifts, uh, to work hard, to do your best. And this is actually the idea of the, the, the root in our society, in our institutions, our, society, uh, our organization, our legislation and self-descriptions. The ground rule in our society is that you, if you work hard and use your talents, you will be rewarded with a job, a good job, uh, a fulfilling life, and then you deserve the support of society because you are a valuable addition to, um, to, our, society, to our society. So this occurrence of perfectionism, which is both a reality as uh, an ideology is called meritocracy. It's the belief, a narrative, that society should distribute rewards on the basis of merit alone. And it's a political ideology based on the equality of chances and forcing each citizen to realize their talents. And it has also an uh, emancipatory as aspect, no aristoc uh, aristocracy or class dictates your fate, but your merit and your talents. So if you do not use your talents or use the opportunity society has given you to improve yourself, then the negative effects like poverty or unemployment are your own responsibility. You can either win or lose. Your fate is in your own hands, your own efforts. And this the concept of uh, meritocracy was coined by British socio sociologist Michael Young in 1956 and has since then become the idea, uh, main idea behind social liberal policies in the age of globalized capitalism. And these meritocratic societies expect the best of each citizen and uh, one has to become the perfect version of oneself. One can also find these meritocratic aspects in many religious, uh, religions in society. Um, think about, but also in, 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 uh, in, in the past, think of the legalism of the Pharisees in uh, Second Temple Judaism. But contemporary forms of religions are there as well, with this uh, tendency towards meritocratic thinking, like pietism, uh, Quakerism and um, Methodism. And we also find it in Adventism, especially in the last generation theology, which is based on the views of uh, John Wesley, A.T. Jones, M.L. Andreasen, and others. And this form of um, Adventist perfectionism, the last generation theology, is as scholar uh, Angel Manuel uh, Rodriguez uh, defines it, a theology which claims that God expects perfection from each believer by obeying the law. And this perfection will con contribute to the vindication of God's character and the soon return of Christ, as Dr. Uh, Galouche also uh, mentioned. So Christ needs the last generation to vindicate God. And in order to do that, the last generation has to overcome sin, just like Christ did by obeying the law. And the, re the reward is to live with Christ on the new earth for eternity. 
So why this presentation on Adventist perfectionism on the one side and meritocracy on the other side? Well, when looking at Adventist perfectionism and meritocracy, we see that there's a growing interest in these two ideas. On Google Book uh, and Gram Viewer, you can do a quick search, a quick scan on how many hits you get of words and, t and, and terms that occur in literature during a certain period. And when you look for the word combination Adventism and Perfectionism, you see that the number of hits of this word combination has increased dramatically since the 80s of the 20th century. And the 80s, which we all know as the era of the bonfire of the vanities, maybe you've read the book of Tom Wolfe, well, it is also about meritocracy. You see this striking resemblance when you compare it with the word meritocracy. So there are, there's a growing interest. And there are also numerous uh, publications on these two narratives, but they exist independent from each other. And I want to explore my hunch that there's a relationship between these two phenomena, um, between the current interest in the last generation theology and uh, within the Adventist church and the popularity of meritocracy in a larger society. And I will explore uh, in part one the similarities between these two narratives, and I will do this through six key points. And these similarities uh, suggest that there probably could be a shared worldview behind it. So that's my second question and also part of the presentation. And I'm fully aware that um, to chase the second question, whether there's a shared worldview, I, had to I have to do a thesis or a PhD to do that. So this is just, just a, a, a tentative, um, a, 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 um, I, I just want to raise this question to think about whether or not we have something in common with some secular ideas within the Adventist church. Uh, so in part three, I will end my presentation with an alternative narrative offering a biblical theological perspective on the subject. Is it biblical, this last generation theology? So first, the similarities in six key points. Uh, well, scholars like Harvard philosopher Michael Sandel and sociologist John Lit Joe Litter of the University of London characterized meritocracy as a self-centered, highly individualistic ideology. It's about self-improvement, character building, and Adventist scholars like George Knight and Hans de la Rondel, Jiri Moscala, Rein de Bruinsma, and John Barna characterize Adventist perfectionism as a human-centered theology or achievement-centered instead of a Christ-centered one. And I will demonstrate that during my presentation. So when you look at the keyword nature of the subject, you see that there's also a striking resemblance. There are the talented ones in, meritoc in meritocratic society. And in Adventist perfectionists, we talk about the spirit-led perfectionist Perfect, uh, per perfect last generation of believer. And also when we look at the uh, landscape, it's about equality of opportunity. We, hear, we all hear many politicians talking about creating equal chances for everybody. And equality of opportunity is about leveling the playing field to allow the best man or woman to achieve success. So the government, makes uh, it possible for citizens, regardless of gender, class, ethnicity or race, to have a fresh start. They will have a greater equality of opportunity to determine how they will make a success of their existence. And that's the landscape the society wants to create. In the USA, they call it the American dream. Yes, yes we can. Adventist perfectionist, like uh, Larry uh, Kirkpatrick, claims, in fact, exactly the same. For every believer, there is a fresh start, he says, and an equal opportunity, an equal opportunity to align him or herself morally to reach perfection. Here, it is not the government who creates it, but it is Jesus who made it possible for man to have a fresh start. 
men and women would have a fair and informed opportunity, an informed opportunity to determine, and I quote, how they will align themselves morally for the rest of their existence. But what are the conditionalities, the fourth key word, for this perfection to happen? It is in both narratives about overcoming defects and failures and to play by the rules. In the meritocratic society, it's the human agency who, um, who is the conditionality for it. Those who work hard and uh, play by the rules should be able to rise, and then I quote, as far as their talents will take them. It's not only Theresa May who says that, but it's George Bush who says it, it's uh, Reagan. No matter wh whether they are Democra Democrats or Republicans, they all have the same idea. If you work hard, you can become the perfect mother, the perfect employee, the perfect student, etc. We are masters of our fate. We get what we deserve. Faults and failures are to be overcome. Talents are to be nourished. And one has to reinvent oneself through education, mobility, and equal chances. When we look at the Adventist perfectionist uh, ideology, we are more or less also masters of our own fate. We also get what we deserve. It's not the human agency, it's the Holy Spirit agency, they say. Sin and failures are to be overcome with help from the Holy Spirit. But the question is, does a last generation believer have a strong case for this claim, for his claim that it is not human agency, but the Holy Spirit that leads someone to, into perfection of character? I would say no. The conditionality to let the Spirit in, as we can read in all these uh, literature of last generation theology, leads to an immense pressure on the believer to do all kinds of things to prove that he or she is led by the Holy Spirit. The same way as Calvinists, for example, try to prove that they are the blessed and the elected ones, measured by the fruits of their works. Adventist perfectionism shows human hubris. Sorry to say that, but the assumption of being enlightened is there, knowing exactly what God wants us to do. If you fail in this process, you are one of the losers. And this resembles a lot to a merit meritocratic way of thinking. The curing of our souls is our object, our passport on the day of judgment. If we do not let the spirit in ourselves, which ask of us merit, we lose. So, in the words of uh, Max Weber, first and then to Andreasen, uh, in his book The Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism, one might call these formulated conditionalities obtaining a certificate of moral uh, qualification. Andreasen puts it this way. Men are to follow Jesus' example and prove that what God did in Christ, he can do in every human being who submits to him. And they will demonstrate that it is possible to live without sin. So, to Andreasen and a lot of other perfectionists, sin is just a series of actions and attitudes. And we can overcome these, they say. Because Jesus, having a human nature with sinful tendencies, could overcome it too, they say, with help from the Holy Spirit. What's the promise, then, behind these ideologies, these theories? What is the goal? Well, they both promise safety and prosperity. Even if the perfect believer's ultimate goal is to vindicate God's character and the soon return of Christ. And Mel Andreasen wrote in the sanctuary service, and I quote, man stands without fault before the throne of God. Christ places his seal upon him. He is safe and he is sound. And also Larry Kirkpatrick writes in his book, Cleans and Clothes, if the Holy Spirit is permitted in, life will overflow its edges. Blessings will be leaking into the world. The gospel transforms. So Kirkpatrick also talks about perfectionists getting blessings in the here and now. So to summarize, 
The implied ontology of the meritocratic um, narrative is self-centered. In perfectionism, it's human-centered. The nature of the subject is talented ones, and the others are the elected or the faithful ones. It's all about equality of opportunity. The conditionalities is about self-improvement. On the one side, in the meritocratic na narrative, it's the Holy Spirit in the perfectionism narrative. It's about getting social esteem, security and prosperity in a meritocratic society. And in a perfectionist narrative, it's about perfection to vindicate God's character, salvation and blessings in life, and getting actually God's esteem. So what's the outcome, the sixth and last keyword of these narratives? Your fate is in your own hands. Meritocrats will say, if you do not work hard enough or use your talents, then you get what you deserve, poverty. Merit, uh, perfectionists will say, you can achieve and experience the effects of the Holy Spirit, and if you don't experience it, you don't surrender enough to the Holy Spirit. The causes, this causes immense fear and frustration. It resembles a lot of the surrender theology of Phoebe Palmer and A.T. Jones, and the theology of Hannah Whittle Smith, it turns out to be toxic. Meritocracy, it's, it causes hubris and feelings of deservedness among the winners, and oppressive and humiliation for others who do not succeed, and guilt and loss of self-esteem or social esteem among the losers. And in an effect, uh, Adventist perfectionist, well, read the excellent work of George Knight. He was a former perfectionist. He talks about judgme being judgmental, harshness, but also feelings of a burnout among the perfectionists. The rest can feel oppressed, humiliated, feelings of guilt and resentment, and the loss of social and communal esteem, and the loss of God's esteem. So the psychological outcome is devastating. Meritocrat Hillary Clinton uh, said on her, uh, her um, presidential campaign in 2016 the following, I won the places that represent two-thirds of America, America's gross domestic products. So I won in the places that are optimistic, diverse, dynamic, moving forward. I won in the places where there were winners and no losers. Former perfectionist believer George Knight said, well, the harder I tried, the more self-centered I became, and the more judgmental and harsh I was with those who did not agree with me. Thus, the more attempt I attempted to become perfect, the worse I became. So, the second part of my presentation is about is there a shared worldview behind this? Well, if we look at this worldview, the current makeup of meritocracy and Adventist perfectionism, then one must conclude that both the Adventist perfectionism as the meritocrat, uh, meritocracy have their roots in Hellenistic philosophy, which forms the foundation of the Enlightenment, as you well know. Hellenistic philosophy emphasizes on the human mind and on the nature as the source of all knowledge. The ideas of the Enlightenment are highly individualistic and has the premise um, as though through that, that we have full comprehension of the situation. Humans can become the masters of their own lives. It's about self-discipline and knowledge. Thomas Aquinas, for example, said, influenced by Aristot uh, Aristotle's cause and effect theory, that God's actions can be seen through cause and effect. If we do this, then God will do that. If we become perfect, then Jesus will return. So, is this all biblical, this uh, last generation theology? Uh, theolo um, theology? Well, the Bible tells a narrative based on God's revelation and therefore is incompatible with the worldview of the Enlightenment. It's diametrically opposed to Adventist perfectionism and the spirit of meritocracy. 
as scholars also as Gunnar Peterson, Hans Larodel, and Woodrow Widen also argue. It is a Christ-centered ontology. It is the merit meritorious intercession of Christ that enables God's people to live in a perfect, loving, and continuous relationship with him in which we can mature. We can read about this in 1 Kings uh, chapter 8, verse uh, 61, and Romans 8, for example. The gospel of grace tells us of Christ's fulfillment of merit on our behalf. So it's about forgiveness. The landscape is also totally different. It's about forgiveness of sins. It's about justification by faith alone in the imputed merits of Christ. It's Christ's perfection that saves us. And the conditionalities is also totally different. It's about a new heart response, as we can read in Deuteronomy 30. It's about a penitent heart. It's about faith, love, love thy God with all thy heart. We all know that phrase. It's a continual personal and loving relationship with God. To be guided by the Holy Spirit, not to be possessed by the Holy Spirit. And the goal and the promise is also different. It's about a reconciliation with God. It's about hope. It's about the faithfulness of Christ and sanctification. It's saved by faith, hope and love in Christ. And after the second coming of Christ, we will be justified on the day of the Lord. Glorification of the body and sinless perfection will then, then be present. It's the constant character growth in the likeness of Christ on the new earth. So, it's a totally different um, uh, outcome. There is no meritocracy in the Bible. It's about theocratic egalitarianism. It's about feeling sheltered, about feeling be as belonging to something greater than yourself. It's about obeying the law as an act of love instead of unconditionality. It's about humbleness. It's about contentment, about hope and love and optimism. There's no quid pro quo in, in the Bible. We can read, there's no quid pro quo. It's about God's generosity, his faithfulness, and the free gifts for everyone who is willing to accept those gifts. Brotherhood. Community, God's people bound together in a continuous loving and close relationship with Christ. Uh, so we can read about that in the story of Job, for example. Uh, in the story of Job, uh, this uh, promise is also very uh, uh, clearly explained. So the gospel unburdens us and liberates us and leads us to love and compassion. What a prospect, what a promise. A most attractive invitation for a burned-out society. Thank you. <laughs>